our heads just a moment for prayer. And he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as it is seen in the mount of the Lord to this day. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful tonight to be a, have this privilege of assembling together in the name of the Lord Jesus to worship him in the spirit of his resurrection. And we're so grateful to you for what you have already uh, done for us by identifying yourself by the word among us and by the resurrection. And our hopes are built so high, Lord, because we know that that the God that we serve is not some historical God, but a present tense God, the one that's uh, raised from the dead and has proven to be the God that was with Moses and with Abraham and all the apostles and still the same God. Then our, we join in with Eddie Pruitt as he said, my hopes is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. Amen. So we thank thee for this great comfort and consolation that we had. Father, tonight, if there be one here among us tonight that doesn't have this great hope, may this be the hour that that one great eternal truth will be revealed to them, Father, that they'll know that the reason they're here on earth is not just to, to work, and that's one of the reasons, of course, but the main reason is to become a son or daughter of God. And may that be finished tonight. Grant it, Lord. Bless us now as we fellowship around thy word. Thy word is the truth. And may the great Holy Spirit take the word of God and divide it to us as we have need. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me be seated. Thank you for the opportunity to come back again tonight. Face you find people again with this glorious gospel. We have uh, announced that now tomorrow morning, the Sunday school, the joint and cooperating pastors are having a joint Sunday school right here. I think that's really nice. And many of them have taken the seats out of their churches and brought them here for the people. And it's uh, certainly a a fine, loyal deed for the people to do a thing. We're thankful to God for the good weather that he's given us. He predicted we'd have storms and things all the time, but he's kept the storms back, and we haven't had one bit of trouble. We're grateful for that. And now, tonight was given. We've been having uh, just regular evangelistic services, and if there's any strangers with us, and we haven't stressed too much on, on sinners coming to Christ. And I took a text last Thursday night, and I've never got to it yet. We just talking about Abraham, and we never got to the text yet, Jehovah Jireh. So we are trying to finish that up tonight, and we're trusting that the Lord will save every unsaved person and fill everyone that's not filled with the Holy Spirit tonight. Now think of it real close while we're here. And while we're, while we're talking, open your heart so the Holy Spirit can talk on the inside to you. What are we doing here anyhow? Just think that over. What has what your life been? What are you here for? Is God, are you in such a condition that God can get all, all that he puts you here for out of you? If not, let's settle that tonight, friends. Amen. It's, um, uh, it's, I got some friends sticking around here from my church. Some of the, one of the trustees I know, and two or three of the brethren, I just recognize a new family sitting here tonight, the Palmers, and over here somewhere drives several hundred miles ever every Sunday to speak up in Indiana. And Mr. Welch Evans and his family is here somewhere. I don't know just where I... Today I've been studying practically all day long and I could hear their voices out there on the outside and I, I knew they were around. Now, tomorrow, tomorrow at 2? Two, 2. At 2 o'clock tomorrow, the entire service tomorrow afternoon is given over to the sick for the prayer for the sick. Now, many people refer to it as a healing service. Well, we don't exactly like to refer to it like that because let's call it a faith service. So if our faith can come to that spot after him identified among us and knows everything that's in our heart and has proved it to us, see, that he is alive and confirmed it by the Scripture. Did you notice how he 
backed up every word by his living presence. Amen. See, now, that shows that you don't have to just think we're just uh, trying to say something as some kind of a mythical something. What this Bible has promised, that's the truth. See? Now, every word is true. Now, I may not have faith enough to make every word of it act, but I certainly wouldn't stand in the way of anybody that did have that faith. Amen. Enoch had faith enough one day to take a after noon stroll with God and just kept on walking, went up home without dying. Uh, I think the church has got to come to that, to a rapture and faith. I mean, I had that faith just now, but I sure wouldn't stand in the way of somebody that did have that faith. So we trust that God will give us great faith and tomorrow that there will not be a feeble person left in the building when the church is We just believe it. And now, if we'll believe it, now I've seen that so many times. I've seen a time where 25,000, just think, now not 2,500, 25,000 outstanding healings taking place with one prayer. Durban, South Africa. They loaded, I don't know how many big bands that you, two of them would fill up this whole thing in here, take a hot putting on a big British van, six and eight wheels on them like that. Just van after van coming down with clubs and wheelchairs or what they call wheelchairs, little things they pack the sick with and bring them down through the jungle and the line to get at you and then shin them up a tree and then coming on to the meeting. And then to see just on the platform a boy, the first one come on the platform was a was a woman, and she was Mark Mohammed with a red dot between her eyes, and I asked her if she spoke English, and she said, just a little. And I said, I see you're a Mohammed, Mohammed. and she said, yes. I said, what do you come for, to me as a Christian? Why don't you go to your priest? She said, I believe that you can help me. And I said, well, I cannot help you unless you believe on Jesus Christ. And she said, well, I have seen the services just there three days. We had about nearly 200,000 sitting men at the place. So then they had them fenced off because it's having tribal wars too. And I said, well, now, you have to believe on Jesus Christ. And I said, did you ever read the, the New Testament? She said, I have. And I said, what did you think of the message I just gave about him being the same yesterday, day, and forever? She said, I believe it. And I said, then, if the Lord Jesus is alive today, he's already healed you as far as his suffering. It's already secured, but you have to have faith. And if he was here, he would know who you were. You know what you've done. You know all about you. You believe that? She said, yes, sir. I said, if he will reveal that, do you believe he then he'd be the son of God and is raised from the dead and is ever living here now? His spirit in me? With these other Christians? She said, I believe it. I said, what you're here for? Your husband's a short, heavy set man. He wears a black mustache. Two weeks ago, you was at a doctor. Here's your name. I couldn't write, couldn't say it. I had to spell it. it Mohammed and name. She said, that's right. And I said, then, and uh, your husband waved in the hall. He's wearing a gray suit and a tan hat. And I said, the doctor was kind of a tall man, thin, wore great horn shell glasses. He gave you a female examination and found you had a cyst on the ovary. She said, that's the truth. I said, you accept Jesus as your Savior? She said, Jesus Christ be my Savior. Next was a little cross-eyed boy. And... Uh, that only you just let the missionaries go get one or two out of each tribe. You couldn't hold them no way at all. So um, they had hundreds and hundreds of the militia trying to hold them. And they couldn't do it. And so then this little cross-eyed boy, they set him up on the platform about the distance of that. And up on the platform was great big cow lilies. You sisters, you're at like flowers. Some of those cow lilies there are 18 inches across. Yellow, white, beautiful. And they had, they're just wild. Had bouquets sitting around. And I was... Um, talking, he set the little boy up, the missionary set him up, and the little fellow was cross-eyed, he just had his dinner, and sometimes their, their diet is very funny, he had, they take a little quill and pluck a cow's veins, and what they call a, a bucket, it's a little uh, sack sewed together skin, and let the, the blood, hot blood run in there, and then milk a little milk in it, and churn it, and it makes a, a delicious lollipop, you wouldn't want one of them, would you honey, <laughs> so, so that's a but he, that's what he'd been eating. His little eyes were crossed. I said, now, anybody can see will know what's wrong with the child. His eyes is crossed. If I could help that baby, I said, I'd certainly do it. But I, I can't help it no more than anybody else. I said, if a doctor could, well, if he wouldn't do it, then it'd be something uh, severely out of the heart of the doctor if he could help it. I said, I don't think they have any way of doing it this time. I said, but now, 
the Lord can reveal to me about the baby. And then it says the baby, his father and mother, is a thin pair. That is, she's a Zula. And they're usually heavy. And I said, this is them sitting right out here now. Their name is such and such. And I said, then the baby was born with cross eyes because the mother, they come from a, they believe Christian because on the inside of the little thatch hut is a picture of Christ hangs to the right hand side of the wall. And I said, and the baby, as soon as the mother showed the baby to the father, it was cross eyed. The father and mother stood up to vindicate that was right. I looked back at the little baby, his eyes as straight as mine. So I said, now you see the Lord. I said, I haven't been in 10 feet of the baby. The baby sealed. Just passed it on through. And I called for the next one. And then when I did, I heard a commotion. Dr. Bosworth and Dr. Ern Baxter, managers of mine in the meeting, they was fussing with somebody and I, making such a commotion. This guy was trying to get on the platform or trying to get up there. And there's several doctors, medical doctors, sitting there. So this medical doctor, he said, he, said, uh, he was talking, he said, I want to talk to you about that baby. I turned around and I said, what's the matter, doctor? I said, how did you know I was a doctor? And I said, you are a doctor. You're, you was raised up in England. You're a British doctor. And told him where he was schooled. And he said, now, Mr. Branham, I can understand where a mental telepathy could, <laughs> could read my mind. I said, I'm not reading your mind, doctor. And he said, but what I can understand, he said, I believe that there's God. And I know that, that Lily can't live there without God. He said, because it's got a life in it. He said, but is he tangible? I set that baby on the platform. I examined it. Its eyes was crossed right there. And here's the baby now with straight eyes. What did it, Mr. Brandon? I said, Jesus Christ. Hey, and he Christ, said, man. he said, uh, well, now look, he said, I believe in God. He said, but I want to ask you a question as a minister now. Did you hypnotize that baby? <laughs> I said, Mr. And you mean the, the British uh, Medical Association give you license to practice medicine and no more about hypnotism than that? If hypnotism will straighten the baby's eyes, you ought to be practicing the hypnotism. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, well, tell me what that is. I said, Jesus Christ. He said, look, said, I believe I said God's in that lily. And Mr. Bosworth said, now you're going to start a riot here because they had segregation too there. You know? So I said, you're going in that tribal war. I said, you're going to start a riot. Now don't do that. I said, you're taking too much time for that baby. And I said, here's what you have to do. The baby was standing there. You put it on the platform. Its own faith and the mother's faith, by telling it that, healed the baby. Its eyes were crossed there. It never touched me or been around me or anything else. I never even no more than looked and seen the baby and looked back to the congregation, saw the vision, told what it was, and looked back, the baby's eyes were straight. And he walked up in front of that big web mic and said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Uh, and God. when I was leaving Durban, he jumped over the fence where many, about 20,000 people was out there say goodbye and are, are leaving, not Durban, I'm sorry, Johannesburg. And he jumped out and grabbed me around the waist like this and told me that he'd give up his practice in the city and is turning into the mission fields as a medical missionary to the people. And while he was talking to them, he started speaking in other tongues. While he was talking to them. That's true. Uh, medical doctor. Angered him. Angered him. Next on there was a little boy, a young man. He, I won't have time to go into his... Uh, he was so... He, he had to walk on his hands and feet like, and had a chain around his neck like a dog. And I said, my, you... That poor fellow, if anybody could help him and wouldn't do it, it'd be a very cruel-hearted person. I said, of course, now, I can't heal him. Anyone knows that. I cannot heal him. I can only just say if the Lord will show me what's happened or what caused it or something, because healing is already purchased. Now, I want you people here that sick to realize that. Healing is already purchased. You're already healed. It's just a lack of faith. All things are possible to them that will believe. You just got to believe that now. And so then we find that this little, this fellow here, I, I said, bring him up here and just leave him by a chain. And he thought, now, sometimes the tribes want to do a, a clown for the tourists. And they do a little dance, you know, a little tribal dance to get uh, coins from the tourists. And he thought I wanted him to do a dance. The boy wasn't even mentally right. And um, I couldn't say in this mixed crowd, because they wear no clothes, you know. They're women, men, and all are naked. So then... They just, maybe a cloud or something. But he was on his hands and feet, and it was just ter terrible. So then um, uh, they held him by the chain like that and brought him up, had it around his neck, lead him. And um, he's trying, going, ah, bah, bah, bah. I tried to make him understand that wasn't what I wanted. And I, uh, Zuli interpreter, uh, I said, now say the words. Tell him to stand still and just believe. And he looked up at me like that. And, and I said, now, the boy, is, uh, he's been that way since the little bitty fella. I said, what he's, really what he's thinking of now, it's his brother. 
his brother was either riding on a yellow dog or a goat. He got uh, thrown, and I said, he crippled himself. He walks on two clubs. And I said, now I see the young man is healed. He's, he stowed away his crutches. About that time, it take 20 minutes to get him quiet. The boy was sitting about three city blocks out there, down in that way. Here he come with clubs up over his hand, just run as hard as he could go. He was healed way down there on that Zulu interpreter. Fifteen different interpreters standing on there. He say a word, he had to wait to go through the interpreters. Here he come with the clubs over his hand, like that. He was healed. And, um, and then uh, I uh, looked around, and then I noticed, again looking at him, I see him standing up. That's the vision. Nothing's going to stop that. No, it's already finished saying see. Just waiting for the word. I look. This coming Monday, I'll be 55 years old. It's my birthday. And I have seen visions since a little boy. I have never seen one of them fail. And I'll ask anybody if they ever seen one that was told ever fail. It can't fail. It's God. So then I seen this thing. I thought, here's my chance now to get, the, uh, to, to get my altar call. And I seen him standing up. I knew he's going to be healed then because, see, it's already sure it has to be that way. Wow, that's what the vision says is exactly what's right. How many knows that those things are true that's for the street? Hey. Never. There's no failing to it. God has always made it right. I thought, here's my time for altar call. I said, now this boy here, I cannot heal him. But if the power of God has showed me a vision, then it's going to be healed now. Now, if he isn't healed, then I'm a false prophet. But if he is healed, how many of you out there will receive Christ as personal Savior? There's, I guess there's 10,000 Mohammedans there. I just talked a few days before that to an intellectual man said, that blessed trophy, you know, they come from the old Medes of Persia. They don't change your offer. You can't change one of them guys. So, and there they were sitting there, one of the Mohammedan women had just accepted Christ and that influenced them and Hatma Gandhi's son was there. So uh, there was, um, uh, there was um, this boy. And so I said, stand up on your feet. Jesus Christ makes you well. Well, he still tried to go up, 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 like that. And I walked over and took the chain in my hand. I said, stand up. Jesus Christ makes you well. Now, here's the Bible. And if you all know, then what's happened in these last few nights, I'd be daring to say anything that would be wrong in this. Amen. There, that boy was afflicted like that, walked, his back swayed way in like a sway back horse. His hands and feet, his Hands were just as calloused as his feet from walking. For the first time in his life, stood on his feet. The tears dropped off of his black belly like that as run down. Like not only was he healed, but in his normal mind. Hallelujah! I seen. I said, now to all of you that will believe, let them believe now while I pray. And I want to know how many here I said will accept Christ as Savior. And I, it looked like oceans. And they registered 30,000 blanket natives that didn't know right from left hand come to Christ. I remember speaking at Aquinas not long ago. And I remember the fellow that ordained me in the Missionary Baptist Church. It always made fun. I said, what, the bad, what you call fanaticism? See? One more soul to Christ in one hour than the tens of thousands of dollars that the Baptist Church is putting missionaries over there. What did we find them? Over there, tagged like a Christian like this and packing an idol in their arm. If Amoya, Amoya means uh, unseen force like the wind. If it fails, this won't. That's the strength of it. And there, I've seen 30,000 blanket natives give their life to Christ. And going to the tribes out in there, winning their other friends to Christ. And I made one prayer for the entire group. And about four hours, the man... Sidney Smith, the mayor of Durban, Sidney Smith, mayor of Durban, South Africa, called me on the phone, which had been a woman that had died the night before that and been called on to pray, and she was at the meeting alive. And so then that was Sidney Smith's relation, and he was all thrilled. And then when this, um, the, he said, go to your window and look coming down the street, and there come those big bands, this pile full, in the natives that had been in those cots and stretchers, that morning was walking behind with their hands up, weeping, saying in their native tongue, only believe. All the things are possible. And no more war among them. Just row after row coming down there as the truck's going like that. And the police escorts and ricochets going everywhere like that. Only believe. Now, if blanket natives 
who doesn't know right from left hand can accept that. What about us? Oh, yeah. hmm? You know why? They've never been indoctrinated with any kind of doctrine. That's right. See? We've had everybody, doctor so-and-so says it's fanaticism. This other one says it's telepathy. This says there's nothing to it. This says it's a devil. Yeah. Uh, you don't know what to believe. Yeah. That's the reason it's hard. The hardest place to have healing services is in USA. Amen. That's right. There, they, over there, they don't know nothing about it. They haven't heard nothing. You tell them. They're just like a child. They accept it and believe it. Way to go. The Lord help us now. Now, just one more time to pray. We can't pray too much. That's one thing. The Bible said, I would that man pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. But receive us, Lord, into your fellowship here. As we commit ourselves to you, the fellowship of your word, for you are the word. We ask in Jesus' name, speak to hearts. Amen. Amen. We left Abraham last night, and we started with him, and over in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, where he was offering up his only son, a type of God giving his son. We started back then, dropped back to pick him up again, his life, and we've never got away from it yet. We left him last night over about the... 16th or 17th chapter. It'll be the 15th chapter is where we left him at. We're going to try to finish it up tonight because i got a message just for divine healing of the Lord willing for tomorrow afternoon. And now every pastor is invited. Bring your congregation. Come here and stand with them for prayer. Now, we realize that sometimes that Jesus did things and he does things sometimes. You say, why would he permit these things then, Brother Branham? Why would he permit uh, these things to be? Sometimes it's done to try your faith. Many times. We, and he does things strange. Why don't he just walk out and say, I am this and I am that? He didn't do that in the first place. See? He does it to try your faith. Look, the priest thought that probably he'd come down and speak to Caiaphas as a high priest. But how was he born? In a manger. And was absolutely rejected by his own people and his denominations of them days. Now we find one time Jesus speaking. It's like... Watch one little quotation here I'd like to make. Jesus has a great crowd around him. And it looked like there was too many. So watch what he said. Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Now what do you think that a medical doctor or any uh, intellectual person would think when they heard of a man that had a name of being an illegitimate child and a more like a renegade to the people of that day, stand up and make a, a quotation like that, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, they'd say that man's a human vampire. Well, my, drink a man's blood and eat his flesh? You congregation, get away from such a crazy man. He never explained it. He never explained it. He didn't have to explain it. That's right. He just wanted to see what kind of faith they have. See, you, if you believe, you believe. I don't care what anybody says. If I prayed for 5,000 people tonight and all 5,000 died tonight in the morning, I'd still be praying for the sick. See? It's what God says is what counts. It ain't what people do. See? And God, he, he said, and except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. My, that people, that intellectual group, uh, while well, they said, get away from that man, he's mad. He's a wild man. Why, well, he's a human vampire. Eat that man's body. Now, he never explained it. Now, he had 70 ordained preachers with him. He thought he had a little too much crowd there, so the, the crowd walked away from him. So he had the ordained ministers sitting there, and he sent them out, 70 of them. He said, what will you say when you see the Son of Man ascending up into heaven from whence he came? I never explained it. And that preacher said, this man ascending up into heaven from whence he came, while we know him, we know his mother. We've been to the stable where he was born. We've seen the cradle he was rocked in. We fish with him. We're laying out here on the banks with him. And this son of man ascend up from whence he come? He come from Bethlehem. Where is this coming up? That's too much for us. And they walked away from him. He never explained it. He, never, he didn't have to explain anything. God don't have to explain nothing. He's God. He just does it because he promised it. He don't explain it. Then his only 12 was left. He turned around and looked to them and said, I've chose 12 of you and one of you is the devil. He said, you want to go too? Then Peter said those great words. To whom would we go, Lord? 
where we are sure that thou has the word of life. Amen. They had seen it so clearly vindicated. Amen. No matter what the priest said, what anybody else said, they knew right there that, that he had the word of life. He said, you have the word of life. And now we notice, no matter what the others done, how they walked away, those disciples were predestinated. They were ordained to eternal life. No, they couldn't explain it. They couldn't explain it more than the rest of them could. But there was something in that. That, that representation in heaven, a thought that God had of them before the foundation of the world, had manifested itself here. And they were connected with God and were sure that was God's promise, vindicated, and nothing's going to change it from them. That's real, genuine Christianity. Today, people are something on the order like there was in the days when the disciples was out on the ocean. And one night, a storm came up. and There wasn't nothing. All hopes is gone that they ever be saved. And they seen him come walking on the, the, the water. Now their ship was waterlogged and the sails was broke and the oars is gone. And they were holding one another, screaming. And they looked out there and seen him come walking on the water and was scared of him. Their only hope. Amen. Amen. And they were afraid of the only thing that could save them. Amen. If that ain't a true picture today again, they, they thought it looked spooky. You know, he said they cried out for fear is the spirit. It looked too, like spiritual. That's the same thing it is today. But if you just do like they did, when they cried out, they heard that voice coming, fear not, it is I, be not afraid, be of a good courage. And if you'll just watch the word of promise for this day, you'll hear that same voice speaking through the word. It's me. I promise to do this in the last days. Fear not. Don't be scared. Put your trust in me, the Son of God, who he is. Believe it now. We left Abraham in the presence of Elohim. Last night, we brought him down to the promises. And now the last promise before the coming of the Son we find out that a man came up dressed like a man, eat like a man, talk like a man. And Abraham looked upon him and addressed him as Elohim. Elohim. Yeah. Two had went down to Sodom to preach. Down there, and we liken that setting to today. You all remember the story where we left it. Just perfectly the same thing the as Jesus predicted it would be, that if it was in the days of Sodom, the same thing sets in the same position tonight. Amen. And if today I was studying there and I was wondering, and I wondered all about this. They heard another earthquake taking place down there, and they said, shaking the countries again. And I thought, what is this? You know, it was done on Good Friday. You know, 1900 years ago on Good Friday, the church rejected Jesus Christ and an earthquake shut the world all over. Yeah. And they rejected Him again. Yeah. And the lady of sin ages, the Bible said they would do. Had Him on the outside. And this ecumenical move of the uh, council of churches is exactly what they're doing. They're forfeiting all their evangelical teachings and things. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? Amen. Well, you can't do it. That won't work with real genuine Christians. They'll never receive it. No, sir, a born-again Christian will never go in a trap like that. It's just like putting a duck in a, in a cage. They know he's headed for the slaughter. You'll never drive him into that. Amen. So we, a real born-again Christian will stay away from that. Amen. Now, Amen. Abraham was standing there and talking to a man that had his back turned to the tent where Sarah was. And Abram's, Abraham's name a day or two before that was Abram. And Sarah, and now it's Sarah to Abraham. And he addressed Abraham in his fatherly, priestly name, Abraham. Where is Sarah, pr princess, thy wife? He said, she's in the tent behind you. He said, I'm going to visit you according to the promise, the time of life. In other words, another month. And I'm going to visit you as I promised, been waiting for 25 years now for this promised child. Not staggering of unbelief at the word of God, but strong giving praise to God. Watch this now. And then Sarah inside the tent, if we put it in street expression, kind of laughed up her sleeve and said, Me, an old woman, 90 years old, and have, have pleasure with my Lord, my husband, him out there, 100 years old. Ceased to be his husband and wife many, many years. 
And, and the man with his back turned to the tent said, Why did Sarah question that? Saying in her heart these things. And that way Abraham recognized who was speaking to him. That was Elohim. Exactly. His sign proved his claim. He said, I will visit you. Why did he say I? How did he call him Abraham? When he was the one that gave him the name. In a symbol. Not in the presence of a man. Showing exactly what would take place. Give him his vindicated authority. And the promised word. That this man that was talking to him was God. Elohim. Now we find out in Hebrews the 4th chapter and the 12th verses. I've quoted twice already the last couple of nights. That the Bible said the word of God discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. The secrets of the heart. And when Jesus could look upon the congregation and discern their thoughts and told the woman how many husbands she had, told Nathaniel where he was, that was a vindication that he was that Messiah. God Emmanuel because he was the Word. That's the way the prophets were. The prophets were considered gods. You understand that. Jesus said so himself. said, how can you condemn me when you call those who the Word of God come to? You call them gods. And how you condemn me when I say I'm the Son of God? And if I do not the works of my Father, then don't believe it. He was the vindicated Word of God for that age. Now, if he'd come with the sign of Moses, it wouldn't have worked. If Moses had come with Noah's sign, it wasn't prophesied that for that day. And all these uh, clergies and theologies and high schools and schools... Uh, educated ministers, which is fine. We're nothing against it. But that's not the message of the hour. That was for that gloomy day. It shall be light in the evening time. He promised these things. I've read it over and over out of the Word. Exactly as it was then, He said it will be again. I could tie it with every scripture in the Bible and show you that it's the truth. Now, His claims there was vindicated when He said who Sarah, what she did behind Him. Now, notice, he promised next month she will conceive according to the time of life, he said. Now, notice the path of Abraham was a type of the royal seed now. If you notice Abraham, the promises to him and to his children, after him. And then his children was first the natural seed and then the royal seed, which was Christ. The first seed, which was by sex, come Isaac. But without sex come Jesus, the royal seed. Now that the blood, see, we are saved by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Notice Jesus was not Jew. Jesus was not Gentile. Jesus was God. He wasn't, he couldn't be Jew or Gentile. Look, the male sect produces the hemoglobin, which is the blood cell. The germ is in the blood cell. I hear you people here, a lot of you, I was riding around the other day watching your, your farmers and you have chickens. Now, a hen can lay an egg. An old mother bird can lay an egg. But if she hasn't been with that mate, it'll never hatch. Yet she can lay the egg. For the egg is in the, in the, uh, the female. But the blood and the life is in the blood. So therefore, his life was a created life, not germatized from some man. And then the egg wasn't married. Because if the egg was married, as most Protestants believe, and Catholic too, that the egg was married. Now, the, it was Mary's egg, making him human. No, if the blood cell was God, so was the egg God. Because Mary could not produce that egg down, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. He, she could not do that without a sensation. So with, with the sensation, what do you make God doing then? Be sex again. See? So both egg and blood cell was God. Amen. Amen. That's, believe that and you'll have faith to walk forward. We're not saved by Jewish blood or by Gentile blood. We're saved by the blood of God himself, a created blood cell. I said, take these old mother birds. It's coming springtime. I was noticing them the other day how they're taking straw and going up into making their nest. Now she can get up there and make a nest and lay a nest full of eggs. And set on them and hover them and be so loyal to them eggs until she she gets so poor she can't fly off the nest to get her something to eat.
But if she hasn't been with the male bird, they will never hatch. They're not fertile. You know that. They'll lay in the nest and rot. And that's the way of some of our churches. We just got a nest full of rotten eggs. They don't have no faith of Abraham. It's time to clean the nest and start back. Get in contact, not with some organization, some theological seminary, but get in contact with the mate, Christ Jesus, who brings the fertility to the spirit of life that's in you. He's the one that makes you believe it. Clean out the nest and start over again. You pat them on the back and take them in and make them deacons and married four or five times and everything. What the world are we coming to anyhow? Send them off to seminary and inject some of that embalming fluid into them and bring them back. And here the other day on an estimation showed that 99% of the Protestant preachers throughout the nation don't believe in the literal second coming of Christ. 87% deny the virgin birth. Think of that. What of our children go to face that honor? God, give us back to the faith again that was once delivered to the saints. Abraham, watch his path as he comes up. He typed exactly with the church. All that Abraham did has... We've watched the church. If we had the week or two here to be here, I could show you step by step. The church has made the same path. The last sign was God, the promised word, speaking to him in human flesh. The last promise before the Gentile world was destroyed, which was Sodom and Gomorrah. Now think, Abraham before, had God had appeared to him in many symbols and lights and forms and signs, but never had God come to him as a human being and spoken an audible voice like a human being out of a human being. And remember, the promise is just now ready to be fulfilled. The Sodom is going to be burned. The last message is on. And there goes the church normal, the church denominal, rather. There, there goes a modern Billy Graham down in there to jerk him out. There's a church elected, not in Sodom, called out, separated. They get a messenger. Notice, the Abraham group got the message. And now what was it? God that had been talking to him all along in symbols and forms and everything come right up. And now he manifests himself right here in human flesh and discerns the thought that's in Sarah's heart behind him. And Abraham said, it's Elohim, the all-sufficient one. Remember, immediately after that, Sodom was burned. Think of it. The church may be getting its last sign. See, we... You've shouted. You've had justification by Luther, sanctification by Wesley, great time shouting, rejoicing, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, divine healing. But where are we at now? God speaking right among us, through us. Audible, just like He did there, and He promised to do it. That's the thing. It ain't something we made up. The Bible said so. Jesus said He would do it. Make yourself again. Notice, and immediately after this, Abraham pleaded for Lot. He said if he could even find f- ten people, he would spare it. But he couldn't even find that the messengers down there. They rejected the messengers. Like at Billy Graham's breakfast when he was in our city, at Louisville, Kentucky. Was that his breakfast? He said, I go into a city. He said, uh, he held up the Bible. He's a great believer in the Bible. He said, I go into a city. And I have a, a campaign. I have 30,000 converts, or decisions. He said... And I'll go back six months from there. I can't find 30. And he said, Paul went into a city and made one convert. And when he come back a year later, that convert had made converts, converts times converts. He had hundreds of converts for that one. Yeah, yeah. He said, now what's the matter? He said, you bunch of lazy preachers. He said, you set your feet up on the desk and don't go out and visit those people. Now, who am I? Uh, an illiterate person like me to contradict the great evangelist. But I'd like to say one word to him. Billy, what preacher took Paul's convert? <laughs> See, it was because Paul took him deep enough that Christ come into him and he was a living fire on down to the living presence. Not some intellectual move or some genre or uh, get some note signed or pledge you'll come to church. Take him on to the baptism of the Holy Ghost and then he'll, he'll be on fire. He'll bring forth children. How can you do it when he's sterile? You can't have children... Unless he's got life himself. 
That's the only way that anything can reproclimate itself. It's by the germ, and the germ is the Holy Spirit. That was in Christ, is in the believer. Now we notice God's last sign to Abraham literally was God the Word. Remember, God the promised Word that had been promised him all along spoke to him in human flesh. A man standing there talking to him, discerning the thoughts that was in Sarah's heart and her back behind him in a tent. That was the last sign. Amen. Notice. Now, he before had appeared to him in many symbols and so forth, such as lights and, and fire and so forth that appeared to him. But now, notice. And immediately, I want you to notice what happened to the old couple. I, I hope you don't count me erratic. And, and if you don't believe this, just leave it alone. Just See, but I just want to tell you what I think happened. Did you notice? Now, how is Sarah going to have this baby? Now, she's 100 years old. Now, somebody said, well, it's different than the Bible said her womb was dead. Yes. And the Bible said they were both well stricken in age. Yes. But he's doing to Sarah and Abraham, coming along this way, just like he promised to do to their seed. And he's done it. Amen. I can prove that. Just exactly the steps that Abraham took. Now, look where he's at here now. When this God come and talked to him in human flesh, made himself known to him. Immediately now, how Sarah go to have this baby? Now Abraham had lived with her, and perhaps he was. It said his body was as good as dead. The Bible said it was his body now dead. Sarah's womb dead, but he staggered not yet. He believed it. Now look, if Sarah, I'm in a mixed audience, and you forgive me, sisters, and you listen to your doctor, and I'm your brother. But now notice, Sarah at 90 years old is too old to go in labor. That heart wouldn't stand it. You know that. And another thing, her milk veins is dried up. They didn't have the health and hygiene bottles in them days. <laughs> See? Had to be a wet mother. Notice. So, how is he going to do it? How is she going to have this baby? Her womb's dead. She's dead in her body herself and Abraham's dead. You know what he done? He changed them. He turned them back to a young man and a young woman. I can prove that. He made him a young man and a young woman. Turn them back young again. Oh, what a wonderful promise. You say, oh, Brother Bram. Well, just wait just a minute. No, just hold on. This may hurt just a little bit to legalists, but I, I want you to see this now just for a minute. I was just teaching like a Sunday school lesson on this. He turned them back to a young man and woman again, about 20 years old. Abraham, now look, he's old. His whiskers hanging way down. His body's good. He's dead. His little old flabby arms. Sarah, a little shawl over her shoulder, a little bitty cap, little grandma hobbling along on a stick. I can see the next morning while Abraham's a big hump in his back, white hair hanging down. And Sarah said, Abraham, darling, why your, your beard is turned black. Well, Sarah, them pretty eyes is shining just like they always did. Your cheeks has got rose in them. Before the sun went down the next night, she was back to a young woman. And he was to a young man. You said, nonsense, Brother Branham. Oh, yes, it was, too. You know, a wonderful promise and type for the royal seed of Abraham. Amen. Immediately come and remember, is it a promise? Yes, we'll be changed. They were changed back to a young man and woman, just showing exactly what the church, the royal seed is going to be done. Amen. You say, is that a promise? First Thess Thessalonians 4, 17. The trumpet of God shall sound and we shall be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Be caught up together. Why? Her body, their bodies had to be changed to receive the sun. And our mortal, vile bodies will have to be changed to receive the sun. Because we'll be caught up. We'll have to be a different body from this. For we'll be caught up in the air to meet him. Amen. Doesn't con Just right with the scriptures, you see. They were changed. If we ever meet the Lord in the air, we can't meet Him with this kind of a body. Because we're earthbound. But we're going to receive one. Hallelujah. That'll go up in the rapture. And the beauty part of it is it's so close to hand. We see all the signs setting right. Won't be long now. One of these mornings there will be a change. 
But remember, it'll only come to that royal seat alone. The coming of Jesus will be so secret, the rest of the people will know nothing about it. You know, there probably won't be too many. As it was in the days of Noah, wherein eight souls were saved by water, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way, but few there will be a find. You say there will be millions there. All through the ages redeemed, sure. But that rapture in place where we're standing now. What will take place one of these days? They're going to say, now, you know, uh, uh, here we are over in a tribulation period. I thought that the church was to be raptured up before the tribulation period. That's the truth. Not the church, the bride. The church goes through the tribulation period, but not the bride. No, sir. She's redeemed. She has nothing to be purified by. She's already pure. The Holy Spirit's come into her and purified her and took away all the foul and bomb of the world. And she believes that word and become part of it. Right. Without the Holy Spirit, nothing doing. It's the bride comes out of the church and there she, that's called the remnant of the woman's seed. It's left to go through the tribulation period. You know, one time, after all the scriptures, Isaiah, Malachi, Three and Isaiah 40 prophesying of the coming of John the Baptist. John came just exactly in line with them scriptures. Amen. And even the disciples come to Jesus and said, Why say the scribes, the scriptures, that the Elias must first come? He said, He's already coming. You didn't know it. Yes. He's coming. They did to him just exactly what he's supposed to do, and you didn't know it. Now, that might be one of these days you could say, what about the rapture? It's already passed and you didn't know it. Amen. There'll be two in the bed. One will be taken, one left. You know, there's about several hundred people disappear on earth every day anyhow, you know. They can't make out for it. And just think of it, the sadness that people will go right on preaching and believing they're getting saved. And Noah entered into the ark and the door shut behind him with the hand of God. The sun come up and went out seven days before anything happened. Yes. And the people went right on preaching, right on making fun and everything else, not knowing that their only mercy they ever had was closed off from them. Think ministers will still be educating preachers and setting them out and things like that are going on as the church moving on and completely without mercy, without anything, cut off completely. The rapture's gone. Let him as filthy be filthy still. Scripture says that. Already come and you didn't know it. Think about that tonight, friends, and watch what's going on. There's not nothing in the world can comfort you now but the Word of God. Right. See, there's no other hopes. Your nation, nowhere else, we're worm-eaten to the core. Amen. Right. You know that communism is worm-eaten the thing. Is spo- it's got to be that way. You ain't going to stop it. The Bible said it's going to be that way. So you just say you're going to stop it. That's all. Get ready for the rapture. It's right. the only thing to do. Amen. Thessalonians, uh, the uh, first Thessalonians 4, 17 said that we'll be changed. Like Abraham was. And caught up a different body. Now Abraham, their old bodies had to be changed. So will ours have to be changed to fulfill the promise. We'll have to be changed. Now you see these old bodies. I wanted to, I was speaking at Aquinas here some time ago. And, um, and a doctor came out afterwards. He said, uh, Mr. Brown said, I appreciate your talk. But said, you know, I can't believe that, uh, that, uh, that anything less than can be scientifically proved. About that virgin birth and things like that and about being God, I said, well, you'll never believe him because you can't scientifically prove God. You've got to believe him by faith, by faith. He said, well, I don't believe anything that's not scientific. I said, are you a married man? He said, yes, sir. I said, you love your wife? He said, I sure do. I said, scientifically show me what love is in. <laughs> I want to buy some. If <laughs> you can tell me what drugstore sells it, I really need it. I said, I, see, just a simple thing. I said, I'll ask you a question. Now, here. Are we made from the dust of the earth? He said, yes, sir. I said, we receive that dust by eating the food that comes from the earth and it is plant life and so forth. You see, you can only live by dead substance. That's right. See, if you live, something has to die so you can live physically. Right. If you eat potatoes, it died. If you eat uh, beef, the cow died. If you eat pork, the hog died. Yes. If you eat uh, uh, greens, it died. It's a form of life. And you only live natural by, by substance of something dead. Dead substance. Now, it doesn't only stand to reason, friend, that you can only eternally live by the substance of something that died for you. Amen. Christ died. Amen. Yay, he rose again. Amen. To vindicate his deity. Notice now, I said, Doctor, 
If I eat food then, every time that I eat food, it goes into my body and it makes blood cells. He said, that's right. Then every time I eat, I renew my life. He said, that's correctly, new blood cells. I said, I want to ask you something then. When I was 16 years old, I ate corn and beans and potatoes and meat just like I do now. And every time I eat, I got bigger and stronger. And then when I got to be about 22 years old, every human being, no matter how much you eat, how well you eat, you get older and weaker. Now, if I'm pouring water out of this cup into this one, and I pour it half full, and then I just keep on pouring it after half full, and instead of coming up, it goes down scientifically. Prove me how that's done. Uh -huh. yeah. How is it that I'm eating the same food, renewing my life every day? According to it, proves it, scientifically proves I'm renewing my life. When I take in new blood cells, same kind of blood I took when I was 16 years old. But why is it after I got about 20-something, then no more how much I eat, I'm going down, getting older and older and older, and we're right, drawing right on down all the time. Instead of filling me up like it did then, now it's taking me down. It's an appointment. That's what it is. But God made a picture. And he got you when he's about 20-something years old. If nothing didn't interfere, like a little cripple boy sitting here, it's just like a, a stalk of corn start up and something lays over it makes it grow crooked. If you can move that crooked thing that made it do that, the stalk will straighten up. It's got to. That's all. Notice, if nothing interferes with it, there you are, fine young lady, fine young man, you and your husband standing together, modern Adam and Eve from the beginning. God said, there they are. Now, death, you, you get after him. You can start taking them, but you can't fully take them till I call. Now, what is it? It's a negative picture. Oh, my. See, that's exactly what he done to Sarah and Abraham. He wiped away the old age. Amen. Old age is a sign of death. And there will be no signs of death in heaven. Amen. See, all memory of death will be taken away. Amen. And there will be no old age. We'll all be young. It's just a picture that God has drawn in your youth. And now, God taken and set Abraham and Sarah right back to that uh, good uh, young age again. So, um, there we are. And another proof I want to show you. Now, I, I, don't, I feel that isn't going over too good. I just have to, you don't believe that. Well, let me ask you. Let me show you something. Let me show you that they did do it. Now, watch. Look where they was on the map when God appeared to them up there beside them. Immediately after that, they took nearly a 300-mile trip. Down to Greer. That's quite a trip for an old man and woman. Yes. Here's this old man now, this whiskers hanging way down on his stick. Here's little grandma, you know, with a little bonnet on, shoveling along behind him, making little four or five inch steps as she goes. And then the trouble of it was, when they got down to Greer, there was Amalek. A king was hunting for his sweetheart. And all those fine women he had down there, the Philistine girls, when he saw Sarah, he fell in love with her. Yeah. Wanted to make her his wife. Is that right? <laughs> Oh, oh, brother, the Bible is just like a love letter. You have to read between the lines. See what it means. God said he hid it from the eyes of the wise and prudent it and revealed it to babes such as would learn. When I'm out on the missions, my wife writes me a letter, and I love her, and she loves me. And she said, Dear Bill, tonight I just put the children to bed. I've worked today. I see what she's reading and what she's writing. But see, I so love her, I can read right between the lines. I know what she's talking about. She don't have to tell me. I know. Because <laughs> I can read between the lines. That's the way it is with God. Yeah. We're not trying to study from some newspaper standpoint, some theological standpoint, but fall in love with Him. Yeah. Get out and read it. Get Him in your heart. The love of God shed abroad in her heart for the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Then go to reading the Bible. You'll see it coming right out between the lines. Yeah. See, you know what He's saying. Yeah. He never said that right out in the Word. Jesus thanked the Father because that he had hid those things from the eyes of the wise and prudent. I well, no one else could read my wife's letters like that because I love her that way, see? And that's the way she writes to me. That's the way God writes to you. It's between the lines. You read it. Here she is now. Sarah, sure, went down there. Could you imagine a little grandma, you know, and all them pretty girls down there in the Philistine company, uh, country, Greer. And here's Amalek there. He's a fine-looking young king. And he wants to get him a sweetheart. So he looks all around there, pretty and everything. But he sees Grandma coming, you know, shaking, nervous, coming along. He said, that's the one I waited for. That's her. <laughs> so, oh, and Abraham said, I pray thee, Sarah, you show this kindness to me. You're fair to look upon. <laughs> said, when you get down there, you say, I I'm your brother. <laughs> and I'll say that you're my sister. Of course, if you don't, they'll kill me and take you. See, you couldn't have two wives at the same time then. See? So then uh, we have, uh, she couldn't have two husbands, rather, at the same time. One of these days, I'm going to preach on that. 
Then you talk about serpent seed stirring something up. You wait till this comes out. Well, oh, well, now, remember. Then we find that when seen that coming little old grandma like that, Amblick fell in love with her and went and took her to be his wife. Yes. Think of that. See where he turned him back? Sure, he had to. This Bible love letter is something God writes to us. He hid it from the eyes of wise and prudent. And he revealed it to babes such as would learn. He, had, he hid his coming. He hid Jesus from the Pharisees. Them Amen. students of the scripture, we ain't got nothing like them today. Amen. No matter how students they was, they didn't recognize him. He was hid. The Bible said they were. And you know the Bible said the clergy of this day would be hid the same way? Amen. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, pr- truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, and despisers of those. All right. Amen. A, you say, that's communist. No, no. Having a form of godliness, but Amen. denying the power thereof Amen. from such turn away. Amen. That's right. This is the sort that goes from house to house and leads silly women laden with divers' lust, so forth. Notice how we find Abraham down there, and Amnon comes over and said, That's the one I've waited on all the time. So he had his girls to come get her and take her out there and oh, maybe fix her all up and make her look like some queen of some sort. And that night, I want you to notice here God's grace to his prophet. This might choke just a little bit, but it's the truth. No matter what it looks like, you look at this, what the Bible said. I can see Amleki thinks tomorrow I'll marry this beautiful Hebrew girl. And she's over in the chambers over there now, and my maids are perfuming her and making her hair pretty and fixing it all up. Now, could you imagine an old 90-year-old woman getting fixed up like that to marry a young king? So we find out that she get this beautiful Hebrew girl all fixed up, and he takes his bath and and lays down, stretches out his feet after saying his prayers, and lay down and said, Oh, my. I would, could you imagine Abraham doing a trick like that? A man that would say a thing like that about his wife. Talk about a coward. Abraham did that. Yeah. There he is sitting out there now after doing a thing like that. Notice. And Amblick that night the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, You're just as good as a dead man. Uh-huh. Said, You've got another man's wife. He said, Lord, you know the integrity of my heart. He said, I, I, she told me that was her, her brother, and he told me that was his sister. He said, I know the integrity of your heart. That's the reason I kept you from sinning against me. See? But that, her husband is my prophet. Look at his grace to his prophet. Though he's in the wrong. See? said, he's my prophet. I not hear your prayers. You go take him, his wife, back and let him pray for you. If you don't, your whole nation's gone. Every womb was closed. Think of that. It's exactly what he said. And Amalek was a good man and feared God. Yes, sir. But you see what the grace of God does? There said his prophet out there to give his wife over to be married to another man, even looking for the promise of the child and things like that. And the grace of God stays with that word regardless of what it is. Right. Her husband is my prophet. And I'll not hear your prayer. No matter how righteous and how good and how smart you are, unless he prays for you, you're a dead man. So he took and restored Sarah back. Oh, my. Then Isaac come on the scene. Now I'm closing quickly. Now I want to get you something. Isaac come on the scene, and then the promise was fulfilled. Now, after Isaac come, a little boy, and he got about 12 years old, so forth, God made a double test of Abraham. After he'd already tested him for 25 years now. Then he made a double test. Now he said, Abraham, I want you to take this son, I, your only son, and take him up to a mountain that I'll show you here in this vision. And I want you to take him up there and offer him up for a sacrifice. And he said he never could, never refused to do it. He just got up the next morning at the Lord spoke to him, saddled up the little mules and took some uh, wood and stuff and clave it and took off with the mules. He traveled three days. And then he got to the place, he looked off in the far distance after traveling three days. Now, here's where Abraham was. And three days' journey, and when man then didn't have gasoline feet like we had today. And any ordinary man can walk 25 miles a day. See, where did he get to back in those wilderness? And he said, now, you wait here. I like this of Abraham. He said to the servant, said, you wait here with the mules, and I and my son will go yonder to worship and we shall return. Hallelujah. How's he going to do it when he's going up there to kill him? God told him to go up there and take his life. But what did the Bible say in Romans 4? 
Abraham knew that he had received him as one from the dead and was fully persuaded that God was able to raise him up from the dead from where he received him as a figure. Hallelujah. Said, you wait your highest going to do, I can't tell you. Can you think of that sister with the baby in your arms and mother sitting in the wheelchair, little boy there, over here, daddy? I don't know how he's going to do it. I just don't know how he's going to do it. But he's going to do it because he promised he would Amen. on the basis you'd believe it. Amen. He does it to others. See? Thus, boy and I, the lad and I will return. See, You wait here and we'll go worship. And they put the wood on little Isaac, a type of Christ, packing his cross. Got to the top of the mountain. Little Isaac got suspicious. And he said, Father, he said, here I am, my son. He said, well, here is the altar. Here is the fire. Here is the wood. But where is the lamb for a sacrifice? Listen to these words. Now, coming from Abraham's lips. My son, God will provide for himself a lamb for the sacrifice. That means God's provided sacrifice. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provided lamb. And when he bound his hands, laid him up on the, on the altar. Imagine what a time that was now. After waiting for him for 25 years and God... May have him destroy the only thing that he had testified about all through the years. Amen. He was a reproach among the people, laughing at him. And here God says, destroy the very thing that's going to give you the only hope you can that my word's going to be fulfilled in you. I've given you the boys 12 years old. They've all recognized him, still made you a father of nations, but go kill your boy. Could you imagine that? God just showing us, no matter what anybody says or anything contrary to that word, refuse to look at it. Amen. Real seed of Abraham believes that. Amen. Destroy that son. And Abraham laid him up on there. You can imagine taking his little curly hair and rolling it back out of his face and his little brown eyes looking up like that and his little lips quivering. See that big bladed knife come out of his father's. Think of a father. Laid his little head back, pull his throat back so he could stab him through the throat with this knife. Oh, in obedience to God, no matter what it looked like, he said, I received him as one from the dead. God's able to raise him up. Raised back the knife and started and the Holy Spirit caught his hand. He said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here am I. He said, stay your hand. He said, I know that you love me and trust me now. See, she wouldn't even, uh, you'd, uh, we're getting the, the, your only son. And just about that time, there was a ram hooked by its horns in the wilderness behind him. I want to ask you something, brother and sister. Where did that ram come from? Look, you're back there, three days journey from civilization in the wilderness. Where these lions, jackals, and all kinds of wild dogs and beasts and things back there would kill that ram right now. Yeah, right. And look, he's way up on top of the mountain where there's no water. Amen. And he picked up rocks all around there making this altar. And the ram wasn't there. But when God needed one, uh-huh. there it was. Yeah. And it wasn't a vision. He stabbed it and the blood ran out of it. It died. Amen. God spoke it into existence this minute and Abraham took it out of existence the next minute. Uh, yeah. See? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide for himself a lamb. Amen. The impossible for the ram to be there. If anybody knows about sheep in a jungle in a wilderness like that, and there were all the wild animals and savage things back there to kill that ram right now. It couldn't have existed back there. And here, up on top of the mountain, was no water, no grass or nothing up there. And he wasn't there a few minutes before that. And just at the moment that God needed that ram, there it was. He spoke it into existence. Just like it appeared to him down there, Elohim. He needed a a body to come down to earth in. So he just gathered up the cosmic light and the petroleums and so forth and stepped into it. See, he's God, that's what he'll do you. If you're in the morning, a spoonful of ashes in the dust, he'll still speak and you'll be there. Amen. He'll call your name and you'll answer. Amen. The seed of Abraham. What a, that promise fulfilled. Notice, it was a ram. Now, if you got just a minute longer, I'd like to explain this. You know, the other night I left it alone. I never even explained it to my church. You remember when he confirmed that sacrifice? Confirmed that covenant to him? Taking a she-goat, took a heifer, she-calf, and split them in two, and took a ram. Now remember, when the royal seat of his faith, remember, it wasn't a she, it was a he. 
It was a he. The promise is fulfilled. Notice, a ram, he. He. To meet the word. He is the word, that ram. Not a she. They were offered first, you remember Genesis 15, the she's. They was the first one, and then he took a ram. Ram was the last. He, ram, the provided word, not the she goat, the organization, the church. Amen. See? Amen. Not the she, the church, but he, the ram. Amen. 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 That's the reason he was born in April. Not in December, as the uh, Roman church put it, yes. the sun god's birthday, and put it with his up on 25th of December when the circuses is going on. If you took a, uh, the study of the history of the church... And uh, you understand that they put that up there. And make, it was the sun god's birthday, the solar. When it stopped, almost still, there's no change in it for five days from December the 20th to the 25th. They put the son of God and the sun god's birthday the same, compromising Christianity with paganism. Yeah. Made December, he couldn't have been born on December the 25th. Why, snowbound mountains up there in Judea, he was born like all lambs are. He was born in springtime. Yeah. And he had to be born on a ram because he was a ram, and ram was April. Exactly. Amen. He was born under that ram. That's what he was. He was God's ram. That was him up there. It Amen. took Isaac's place. Amen. Amen. What you see? There it is. Show here plainly the royal seed bride will not be called by the she church denominational she goat Praise sacrifice. Lord. No. But by him the manifested word of the ram. Amen. For he is the word and the ram. Not call, he said not called by her name, but called by his name. Yes. He'd take a people out of the Gentiles not for her name, but for his name. Amen. Would bear his name. Amen. Oh my. Amen. What are you afraid of it for then? Amen. A Gentile would bear his name. The ram, not her name. The church. Not she, but he. Hallelujah. 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 The royal sheep would see it. Can't you see Malachi 4 coming to pass? Restore back to the original faith, the word of God. Yes. Hallelujah. Surely you people can see that. Hallelujah. We don't have to make it any plainer. Let that denomination go. <laughs> Get back to that word. Amen. And the voice of the last day and the sign of the last day is to swing the people back to their original faith. Amen. Malachi 4 said so. Amen. Back to the Word. And He was the Word, not her, Him. Amen. Amen. The name of the Lord Jesus. The vindicated Word. Now by the promise. The Word that promised. St. John 14, 12. Works that I do should you also. Malachi 4. The same thing is said there. Also Luke 17 tells us that in the last days, the manifestation of the world will be set just exactly in order like it was the days of Sodom and God would come down, manifested in human flesh and would know the secrets of the hearts. Amen. Amen. Jesus said that thing and it take place in the days when the Son of Man is being revealed at the end of the world. Amen. See, it's not the church. Join this, join that. It's come to Him. Amen. That's what Abraham's seed got there, sacrifice, offered instead of his literal seed. Why about his spiritual seed? Yes. Amen. Amen. His royal seed, the queen's seed. Amen. Oh, if you could just see it. Remember, what is it? It's flesh and spirit uniting. Amen. Coming one. Look in Matthew, third chapter. Here was flesh, virgin born son of God, coming down out of the, of the city, walked out to John the Baptist. And there he was standing in the water. The Bible said the word of the Lord always comes to the prophet. Is that right? Amen. And John was a prophet. He hadn't had a prophet in hundreds of years. But here he was, a prophet, standing there. And he was prophesying that Jesus would come. He'd been out in the wilderness and said he'd seen a sign. God told him that sign would be following that Messiah when he come. He said he's standing among you somewhere now. There's one among you whose shoes I'm not worthy to lose. He'll be made manifest in one of these days. And when he does, then I'll decrease. He'll increase. He had to look and see that sign. He said, here he comes now. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The old Baptist preacher, Dr. Davis, that baptized me into the fellowship of the Baptist church, disgusted at me one time. He said, you know what happened there, Billy? And I said, 
Oh, no, doctor. He said, here's what happened. John had never been baptized. He said, John baptized Jesus, and then Jesus turned around and baptized John. I said, I, I don't know about that. So I kept praying about it one night in a vision. Here's what it was. See, he never, he never, uh, jo- Jesus never baptized John. Well, what? Je- he said, I have need to be baptized of thee. And why come a sound to me? Jesus said, suffer that to be so. Watch them two eyes. Two main men on earth. There was God. Amen. Here was his prophet. Yes. And the word come to the prophet. Amen. If the word's in flesh, it'll go to the prophet. No matter where it's at, it'll go to the prophet. Yes. It's got to. The Bible said so. Yes. No. And here come he was the word. In the beginning was the word. And the word is made flesh and dwell among us. And here come the word to the prophet. Right out in the water. To fulfill and vindicate his prophecy. Amen. <laughs> here he stands there. And here them two eyes meet one another. One the prophet and the other in the word. And if John humbled before him, he said, I have need to be baptized to thee. And why come a sound to me? He said, suffer that to be so. For thus it is becoming to us, behooving us, see, becoming, to fulfill all righteousness. Yes. John being a prophet and know that word because the word come to him. He know that that was the sacrifice. And according to the law, the sacrifice had to be washed before presented. Yes. It's exactly, he baptized Jesus because he was the coming sacrifice. Amen. Before he could go to his public life, he had to be Whoa. baptized because the sacrifice must be washed before it's presented. Amen. Amen. He baptized him. And when he did, he went straightway out of the water and he looked up and saw the Spirit of God like a dove and a voice coming from it said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am pleased to dwell in. Amen. God and man become one. Amen. Adam and Eve was one at the beginning. And when he separated them, she fell because of the word. She missed the word. She fell. So has each church age fall like that on account of misinterpreting the word. Letting the interpreter that Satan interpret to Eve. Oh, surely that couldn't be right. Surely this, uh, surely these all can't be, this can't. Oh, yes, I know. Surely, but if God said so, that makes it so. And no surely to it. You must be born again. You've got to receive the Holy Ghost. Either that or perish. Notice, and here, here coming in, Jesus and God became one. They united. Like in Eden, where their, um, Adam and Eve was in the beginning the same spirit. Their names was called Adam. See? He was both Adam and Eve together. And when we were separated to go to the test, what happened? Eve fell by the word. That was the word. Adam went out after to redeem her. But he couldn't do it. He wasn't worthy to redeem her. Then along come the second Adam to redeem the church which was in shadow and type. Now, as sure as Adam and Eve had to be the same spirit, Christ and the church has to be the same spirit. The same ministry. The things that I do shall you do also. You see what I mean? They had to unite together. Flesh and blood and God had to come together and be one spirit. And Jesus Christ and His church is one spirit. Amen. How can the church deny creation? How can the church deny the thing that Christ told them to do? How can we deny it and then say that we are Christ? Amen. If ye abide me and my words abide you, that's what you will and it will be given to you. I am the vine, ye are the branches. And the life that's in the vine goes into the branch to bear the fruit. Fruit bearers. And every limb that don't bring forth good fruit is cued off. That's why organizations, they break it up. Get the word mixed up and start off like that. And one starts one this way and one that way. And first thing you know, a few little bunch of rickies come in and they get their idea. And the first thing you know, they become a big bunch of babbling. He just prunes it off. Never did an organization ever rise. But what it fell and everyone fell, never did come back again. I challenge that to anybody. Amen. You know, in history, there never was one God as soon as you organize, he puts them on the shelf and that ends it. Right. He'll take a man from somewhere else, bring it right out. Yeah. Certainly. Right. Notice in this now. They have to become one. Jesus said then the life that's in him will be in his church. And here's exactly what he promised in the last days, that the life that was in Christ that was in, will be manifested in the days that the world's in a Sodom condition, just like it is now. Can't you see, brother, sister? What good does it do to join church if you haven't got Christ in your life? And Christ identifying himself in your life. That's it. These signs shall follow them that believe. He said that. How could you say it if it's not how can you claim to be Christ? You say, Brother Branham, 
How do you think you're ever going to make that stick with the people in this intellectual day when everything is a denomination? I asked a woman not long ago, are you a Christian in a hospital? She said, I'll give you to understand I burn a candle every night. Like that had anything to do with Christianity. I, I went to pray for another woman. Now, another lady was laying there sick, her and her son. And I said, come in. I said, lady, we, uh, yeah. I said, I know who you are. You're Mrs. Oliver. She said, yes, Brother Brand. She said, I've been very sick, Brother Brand. The doctor can't find what's wrong with me. Would you offer prayers for reason I called you? I said, certainly, Sister Oliver. I said, would you mind buying it? She said, wait just a minute. Pull that curtain. And I said, well, uh, all right. I said, I just go to pray. Are you a Christian? She said, we're a Methodist. Well, I said, that wasn't what I asked you. I asked you if you was a Christian. <laughs> She said, pull that curtain. See, that's just how narrow. How could a person ever be? That's blackness and darkness, denominational difference, cutting them off from the blessings of God. That exists in all denominations. Amen. That's right. Brother, don't go to she, take on him. Don't take her name, take his. Mm -hmm. Take his name. You say, Brother Branham, how are you going to make it stick today? How are you going to do it? He made the promise that he would. said, fear not, little flock. It's your father's good will to give you the kingdom. How's he going to do it? He's still Jehovah Jireh. He's still Jehovah Jireh. God can provide for himself, a church. He's able to be stones to rise, children they have. He certainly, he's Jehovah Jireh. Say, will it work? It's sure. God promised it. You think you'll ever make it? I can't, but he will. I'm not responsible for making it do it. I'm just responsible for preaching it. It's his business to confirm it. That's him. If I stand by the truth, he'll stand by it. He's proved it. And he will do it. He said it's awful dark. Yes, I know it's awful dark. And all the ecclesiastics going into this great big organization to a slaughter. So what are you going to do about that? This reminds me of a little story. I might say this just before closing. Down at Carlsbad, New Mexico, here they had the caverns there. You know, they got to go down about a mile down that... I never did like that stuff. They always like a mold in the ground. And it went down in there. And, oh, it gets midnight dark down there. And there's uh, some little girl standing, oh, probably like that little thing there. And her little brother was standing over here uh, to one side with the guy that was taking them down. So they were standing down in this dark place. And there was light then. They had all the lights on. And this man, just for the guy, clipped over to the light. And this little boy was walking along with him, watching the guy. So the guy got over there and took this switch. And he just... Threw the switch off. Oh, my, talk about dark. A mile deep in the ground, you know. So dark you couldn't wave your hand, couldn't see nothing. And that little girl was screaming for all was in her. She was just jumping up and down, screaming, screaming. Hard. And out of all the scream, the little boy standing over one side, he said, Oh, little sister. Oh, little sister. She said, What do you want, little brother? He said, Don't be scared. There's a man here that can turn on the lights. Amen. <laughs> There's a man here that can turn on the lights. He, he Jehovah Jireh. He, there's a man here that's among us tonight. The Holy Spirit. He can turn on the lights. He is the Word. A man here that can turn on the lights. I don't know how he'll do it. It's not for me to know. But he knows how to turn the switch on. He made the promise. He made it up there when... Uh, Abraham had his knife above his son's throat. He turned on the light. Yeah. Yeah. He could turn on the light again tonight. Let us bow our heads just a minute. God, help that he'll turn that little switch in your heart. Friends, this week you've seen the great Holy Spirit among us. There's no question to that. But oh, let that little light be turned on tonight. Don't miss it, my brother, sister. I think it just with this one little chapter here of... Uh, of Abraham has proved, just linking it back and forth from Genesis to Revelations has proved what hour we're living in. Christ rejected in our nation again. Earthquakes in diverse places. Sodom and Gomorrah. The church in its condition. Exactly forming the image of the beast. All these things has taken place. As the Bible said, and you people know that. See, Now, without this great experience with Christ, if a life of Christ comes in you, now just take a look at yourself in God's mirror and just see if you can identify yourself tonight. If you've been living in the days of, of Noah, the time of the flood, what side would you be identified with? If you was living in the days of Moses, what side would you have been on? If you'd lived in the days of Christ, when all the churches was against him, he had to stand alone out there and the things he did, only thing was God with him. That's the only thing. Even all his disciples nearly walked away from him. 
But what side, just your present state now, where would you, what side will you be on? What side would you be on right now? When you see him again, right among us. Now he sure you can turn the light on your heart and just fill your life with the Holy Spirit. How many here now with your heads bowed and your hearts too will pray with me just a moment? Now, Heavenly Father, we know that you just don't come along and, and do things just to show that you can do it. You're doing it for a purpose. And Lord, this week I felt led to wait to this minute, this very time, that first they would see that the word is confirmed. It's beyond any question now. And this one character, Abraham, when all characters in the Bible are tied right into it, and we see where we're sitting right now. Father, with a broken up word, but it's the best I could do. I pray now that the great Holy Spirit that's here that knows the secret of every heart will speak to that heart right now. Do, Lord. Speak to that one that would not go if you was coming tonight. If the door would be closed tonight. If they would die on the road home or get hit by a car and kill. Or die, be found dead in the bed in the morning. They wouldn't be saved. Oh, God, please don't let none of them go that way. If they've just joined church, Lord, may they not be ashamed to step out and ask God for a filling of His Spirit that His life would come into them. If they haven't been able to understand these things, neither the disciples, but they held on until the Holy Spirit was poured out, then they understood it and wrote the Bible. I pray, Father, now that you speak to every heart and let them know that the man that can turn the light on is right at their heart's door. With our heads bowed now, how many in here will be real honest and say, Brother Branham, I, I know that I'm not right with God. I want, you, I want you to raise your hand. Just keep your head bowed, everybody. But raise your hand. I'm not right with God. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, I, hands. I know I'm not right with God. See what I'm trying to do. Find favor with God for this great healing service tomorrow. If I can just get favor, I, I, I don't believe there'll be a thing left. But what will God will heal if I can just get the people to believe. Now, you without the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and you know that is the oral. If you didn't have oral in the lamb, they did not go in. And did you ever hear of such a time in the papers where Presbyterians, Lutherans, look at the Christian businessman's magazine, Lutherans, Presbyterian, even Catholic are seeking to find the baptism of the Holy Ghost by the hundreds. And I wonder if those full gospel businessmen understand that they will not get it. The Bible said, when they come, said, give us some of your oral. They said, the sleeping virgin. They realized they'd had all that time to get oral, but they didn't do it. So when the bridegroom was just about to come, they said, give us some of your oral. They said, we just got enough for ourselves. You go buy from them and sell. And while they were gone, the bridegroom come and the bride went in and they were cast into outer darkness to wake up and find out the rapture was gone and they were left. Where they'll be weeping and wailing the tribulation period gnashing of teeth. My brother, sister tonight, my friend, if you haven't got the Holy Spirit, well, if you are convicted enough to know that you should have it, would you raise up your hand and say, pray for me, Brother Branham. I believe we're in the presence of God. Pray for me. I do not have the Holy Ghost. God bless you. Just look at the hands everywhere. Do you want it then? Now, I know to you Methodists and Baptists and so forth, there's a lot of fanaticism that follows any message. Now, to you Lutherans, I was just reading the history of Martin Luther. One of his books was wrote on him here not long ago. He said it wasn't so mysterious that Martin Luther could protest the Catholic Church and get by with it, but to hold his head above all the fanaticism that followed his revival. Yeah. And that goes as a mixed multitude with ever revival. You know that. But now remember, that only indicates that there's a real one. When you see a bogus dollar, somebody's making out like they got something, just remember there's one genuine that's made off of. If it isn't, that's the original. So you know that that can't be the original. So there has to be original. And that original is the real Jesus Christ. The one that's here that knows every secret in your heart right now. And I'm going to ask you, if you've seen him and hear these testimonies of all kinds of things being healed and how the people's hearts has been made known through this week. And you, that's him talking to you. That's him. I wonder if you believe in me praying and for you would help you. You remember, the Holy Ghost was given by laying on of hands. 
Peter, after Philip had went down to Samaria and baptized all the people down there in the name of Jesus Christ, yet Peter came down and laid hands upon them and the Holy Ghost came upon them. See? Now, if you believe in that, I wonder if you'd come up here, each one that's not saved or haven't got the Holy Ghost, would come here and stand right here just a minute. Let me pray for you. If you just come from the aisle, no matter where you are, and stand here, just walk up here and let me... Let me pray with you just a moment. God bless you. I just, everybody sing now. Almost persuaded, if you will, Sister Downey, if you will. All right. Won't you come right along here, my brother? God bless you, my brother. Everybody real quiet now, pray. This might be the crucial moment. might mean the difference between death and life to many, many people. Have you all been here this week? Have you seen the Holy Spirit, what He's did this week among the people? In Christ to receive all aims now some soul to see. Won't you come without God, without the Holy Spirit? You just say, I belong to church, Brother Bram. That's what I know what I'm talking about. I mean, are you filled with the Spirit of God? You'll never find a more convenient day than right now when Jesus Christ identified among us. Oh, me. What if you die before morning and then you can't call? Won't you come now while he's calling? Oh, That's right. Just keep coming. Somebody holding back. Don't do it, brother. Don't do it. Here, let's see your hand. There should be this many more or more. I feel that feeling. See, he isn't there's something wrong yet. Better come. Remember, I can't I can't force you to come against your own will, but I believe this might be the time. All that what you've looked forward to, it might be fixing to happen right now. And this could be, I hope it's not. It could be the last time you'll ever be called. Remember, he won't always strive. He'll call, then he'll turn from you, never to come again. Why don't you come right now? Why don't you come up here and just represent yourself for God? Say, I'll come stand. I'll take the way. I'm not ashamed. I belong to church, but I want the whole world to know that I'm ready to receive Christ in my heart, the Holy Spirit. I'm coming now to do it. I'm ready to straighten up, be a real Christian, a real lady, a real man. Won't you come? We'll just wait. Come right on down. That's right. Out of the balconies and aisle. Come down. You're just make your stand. Friend, I may never see you again. This sign of the great time. But if I don't, remember, I'm going to be innocent now. So is Christ. He's identified himself with you. You'll see him do the same thing in a little bit. All right. Now, come down. Take your stand. Why? You say, Brother Bram, you're judging me. No, I'm not. I'm judging this feeling that's in me. See? There's something in here that says, oh, there's more. There's too many more. See? Now, you say, well, I, I've joined church, Brother Bram. I'm Pentecostal. I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that, friend. I'm not asking that at all. I'm asking, have you got the life of Christ? You say, Brother Bram, I've spoken tongues. That's good, but that ain't still what I'm asking about. You say, Brother Bram, I never harmed anybody. That's not still what I'm asking about. Is the life of Christ in you? Don't take no chance, friend. Don't, don't, don't do that. It's going to be, when, you, when death strikes, it's too late then. Don't do it. Please don't. Now, we've got so many here right now. I'll have to give a little room for some more. I'm going to pray for these then so we can go in and get in room there so we come lay hands on and receive the Holy Ghost. And then we're going to pray right now for these. You bow your heads just a moment. 
Our Heavenly Father, here are those bowed here. They're men and women. They're eternity-bound people. They, they must go. We know that. And we see earthquakes and the world in the position it's in now and see the Christ come to us and do the things that He's doing and see the message, the Word, go right out and then see Him come right behind it and vindicate it to be true, knowing every secret of the heart. And these people now have come forward to make a stand. They couldn't have done this by themselves. They've come because they were led to come. And Father, I'm offering prayer for them right here. Not only for their salvation to be saved, but they might be filled with the Holy Ghost. Grant it, Lord. May each one standing here be filled with the Spirit. And may from here come a revival through this country that will just shake this community and all this country around about. Grant it, Lord. In every church, in the Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Lutheran, whatever it might be, may they come a revival, Lord, of these people going back with the real Holy Spirit manifesting God in their lives. Grant it, Father. They're yours now. And I offer them to you. Now we're going to take them in and lay hands upon them, Lord, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' name. Now while we all have our heads down, I'm asking this group now, follow the, this man right here by your side, so I can get, we get to you back over here in the room. we got a place over here for you. Kneel down. We come lay hands on you that you'll receive the Holy Ghost. And if you're sick, you'll be healed. and Just whatever you have need of, go right here now. We can get right in with you. This more has to come with your, your little... There's no room for him to stand. We just won't make this double call. Now go right in here to this, this side over here. That's right. God bless you. Now, to the rest of you here now, as they move out, why don't you move right up here now again for prayer? We fill this place up again around here now. We're going in there to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We're going in Amen. after we see the identification of that Lord Amen. Jesus Hallelujah. here before us this week. And no beyond a shadow of doubt. That's that same here. Now remember, the same Holy Spirit, the same Jesus, that would tell me what was married to those people, where they were, who they were, where they come from, what's going to happen to them. And you know it never failed one time, and it never will. Never will. That same Holy Spirit told me to do this. That's right. I'm doing it by the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Now, while this, as soon as this group gets out in this other room here, before we go over there, we want you to come now. You here, come Move up this way now, the rest of you here that wants the baptism of the Spirit. Won't you come right now? Move up this way, if you God bless you, young man. And if some of you are sick and not filled with the Holy Ghost, why don't you come receive Christ? Receive Him, and then you'll stand better. And I, this lady was just stricken down by the... She so in her conviction like she couldn't stand it. They're helping her to the room. Come on now, you. Next of you here now, there's plenty of room standing around now. Come on up, you. That's church members. Methodist, Baptist. We're not asking you to... Listen, friends. I know they say Pentecost, they organize Pentecost. That's wrong. Pentecost is an experience. The Methodists get it. The Baptists get it. All of them get it. Pentecost is not organized. It's an experience. And if you haven't had the experience of Pentecost, come receive it now. Remember, if you believe me to be his servant, his prophet, remember, there is a genuine baptism of the Holy Ghost. Right in the midst of all the fanaticism, there's still a genuine Holy Ghost. A genuine one. You come believe it right now. Won't you come? While we sing just one, two more verses of this song, so I can be sure that my soul is clean when I leave this city now. The blood won't be upon me. I know he's speaking to others. Why don't you come? Then, now, to God bless you, little boy. God bless you all standing here now. Oh, that's right. Come on. First way. Come on from any side of the building, outside, inside, balconies, wherever. Come right on down now, right down here. Take your place for Christ. Don't be ashamed of him. If you were dying, what if you felt your heart skipping right now? And remember, that one is speaking to you. He holds your heart in his hand. He knows the secret of your heart. I say it in the name of the Lord. There's many more here to come. Why don't you come? You say, is it me, Brother Renham? Yes, it's you. If you're not positive, don't take no chance. That's right. Harvest is about past. Come on. Oh, one day you'll be too late. 
Don't wait another hour, another minute. Get right up and come on. Young man, bring your girlfriend. Bring your boyfriend. Mother, bring dad. Come on. Right now, everybody, young lady, young man, whoever you are, old man, old woman, come on. This is it. If you're old, remember what I just showed you by the Bible. You're going to be changed if you just accept the seed of Abraham. Yes, bow our heads now. Lord Jesus, oh God, search every heart, search every one, great Holy Spirit. Oh God, let it not be in vain to this even one person. May every one, every one, Lord, be saved. Don't let a one of them stray out, Lord. I claim them in the name of the Lord Jesus for the, for the jewels of the crown of my Lord. Oh, whose presence is here now? Yes. The great pillar of fire moving around to the building, sweeping over hearts. I pray, God, that that heart will break off them shackles and raise up and come sweetly to Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, all I am, here I am. Take me and mold me, Lord, in thy great molding house and fill me and make me a son or daughter of God. Grant it, Lord. May this be so while we continue to sing one more verse, will you? Then we're going to have to close now quickly because we got to get over here with the rest of them. Oh, come now, come right now, won't you? God bless you, honey. In the mouth of babes, he receives praise. Oh, 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 persuade. If it's me, if there's one speck of doubt, come. Our lingering near prayers right from our so dear. Oh, come. Let us bow our heads on a while. These get ready. As you stand here, just look down. You remember you had to come by saying some pulsation of something inside of you, telling you there's a little something wrong in your life. I admire your stand. Remember Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father and the holy angels. But he that will confess me before man, him will I confess before my Father and the holy angels. And now there's quite a few people back in here now. It's ready to join with us now in prayer, but you will be saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Just tell him you're sorry for what you've done, and you're going to be a Christian from now on by his grace, and you want the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's going to lead you down through life's journey. Amen. Heavenly Father, they're jewels to your crown. They could not have come. They could not have come unless something warned them. And you said, no man can come except my Father draws them. And all that the Father has given me will come. And here they come by something telling them to come. Then you're starting a work, Lord. I pray that you'll finish it tonight in them, Lord, by making them sons and daughters of God. Grant it. May not one of them be lost. I present them to you now as trophies of your word in your presence. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Now, go right back in the room till we can get to you. Go to the right here. The ushers will lead you right back. And now, now I wonder if the personal workers now will come follow these right in. Many of the personal workers from other churches, you ministers that wants to go back in there with us now to find out whether this is done just right or not. You come go back with us. Come kneel with your people that they receive the Holy Spirit. Each one, come right with you ministers, any of you, Methodist, Baptist, Presbyterian, no matter who you are, come on, you're invited, come with these people, and you personal workers from different churches that knows how to pray with people, lay hands upon them, come now, these are, these are placed into your hands, they're trophies of the word, 
Won't you come now at this time, your personal workers, and make your way back before we change the meeting here just for a minute? Come now. Move right in. That's fine. Go right back into the room. Lots of room back there now. Go right back and do everything you can to help these dear people. There Jesus has brought them. He has caught them into the gospel net. Now you take them back there and let's pray with them and God will fill each one of them with the Holy Spirit. Close the door. Stay right there until it happens. He promised he would do it and he promised and he'll keep his promise. He's just as true to his promises to appear here before us. Lord, bless them. Ministers, are you here? Preachers, laymen that's interested and watching or getting people to receive the Holy Spirit. Your post of duty now. Go with them. Stand by your people. You well-trained man, experienced with the Holy Spirit, you well-trained women that knows what it means. You get with them sisters back there where they are. You that knows what to do. Stay with them back there now. Right now is the time for you. This is when you're supposed to do it. This is your color. Now to go. God bless you. That's right. Just take your place and go right in with them there and stay there and be sure that, that it's done and done right. Stay there until you see the sweetness of Christ in each one of them. God will honor you for it. Amen and amen. Oh, I love that. Just look what went back in there. Is there one more in here that did not go in, that should go in? If there is, will you get up and follow these personal workers right in? Do it, will you? If there's one in here that, that doesn't feel that, that you're just where you should be. Now remember, brother, sister, I, I cannot make this happen. See, God is the one who does these things, not me. Now, I pray that God will just grant these things to you and give you uh, uh, an experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. All you people now that love the Lord Jesus and wants to go in and pray, go back here now and pray with these people. Will you? Thank you. Thank you very kindly. You know, when I see personal workers going with people, I have, I want to say this about you people here, that proves what you're made of. I've went to places even in people who are supposed to be a spirit-filled people and see altar calls made in why you couldn't get people to go in with anybody to pray with them. See, that shows it's Echabod. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. See, but when you see that zeal and fire, longing, long for human souls, you know, to see the weak, I just took my time and watched discernment and things like that, that the people would catch it and find out the Holy Spirit is near. Then make that altar call. Do you ministers understand what I was doing? See, to make the altar call. Now, when they was convinced, hundreds of them are in there now to receive the Holy Ghost. Many went in with them to pray with them. Now, if there's anybody else here, so I'll say this, that you have seen the presence of Christ this week vindicating himself here. You've seen him. And now remember that no blood will be upon me at that day if it's tomorrow. It's going to be one of these days. Just remember, we are going to stand there. No matter who you are, you're going to stand there anyhow. Once appointed to man to die and after that the judgment. And we're going to stand there. Now, if you're not perfectly sure that you've got Christ, the Holy Ghost, in your heart. And he's vindicating himself in there with love and peace and joy and the fruits of the Spirit and the life of Christ living in you. Then remember, your blood's not on my hands. Neither will he be guilty because he's appeared before you and showed himself here exactly with the scriptures. How many will witness that by raising up your hand and say, I've seen it this week. That's right. Amen. Then we're without fault. We're without excuse. Now, is there any, what's one more that would like to come? So what I can say is when my time gets ready to leave, here tomorrow, if Lord willing, I can say I'm free from all the blood from that revival. I did my very best, Lord. I commit it to you. I, you just, each one. Now, how many in here that's sick and needy now and would like to have prayer for yourself? Let's see you raise up your hands. All right, all over the building. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something for me. Now, are you believers? Now, I want you to do something for me now. Lay your hands on one another. Just lay your hands right across on one another. And Now, look, I want you to pray. Just pray. Now, remember, all the people that's going to come into the line of prayer tomorrow must be here early and have a prayer card. Hold it in your hand when it comes time for the line now. If you've got a loved one, 
you Methodist brethren, Baptist, Presbyterian, whoever you are, if you got sick ones, that you, you come right with them. Come right on up in the line with them. Come, get you a prayer card. Cause then bring your prayer card right on in the line. The ushers will pick it up. They'll be come by and prayed for. I believe God's going to do some great things tomorrow. I'm hoping He is. That's the reason I make all your calls, do everything I can to find favor with Him. Now, while we all bow our heads, and you all are praying one for the other. Now, the Bible said, These signs shall follow them that believe. Now, you pray for the man or woman you got your hand on. For they are praying for you. See, don't pray for yourself. Pray for them. Lay your hands on one another. And pray. Just lay your hands. That's right. Now pray the way you do in your church. Say, Lord Jesus, heal this poor dear sister, this poor dear brother, whoever it might be. They're sick, Lord. And I, I'm a believer. And I'm going to follow your word. And your word said, these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. And I'm laying my hands upon the sick. This sick person, this sick brother, this sick sister... I, I, I pray, God, that you'll confirm your word and the sign will follow and they'll be healed. Lord Jesus, I pray for them and for these handkerchiefs that in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that you'll heal every person that's in divine presence. Satan, you've lost the battle. They've seen the presence of Christ. They've heard his word, seen it manifested. Sinners are in there seeking salvation. You've lost the battle. Come out of these people in the name of Jesus Christ. Lead them that you torment them no more. And let the God of heaven raise them up to life again and good health and strength. May them who are holding prayer cards not even need to come in the prayer line tomorrow. May the Holy Spirit just surge this group of people and heal every one of them for the glory of God. I pray for them.